Hey everybody, in this lesson we are going to talk about Cori cycle. So what is Cori cycle? It is named after husband and wife called Carl Cori and Gertie Cori in 1929. It is also known as lactic acid cycle or glucose lactate cycle or lactic acid fermentation. And the bacteria which makes yogurt, they carry out the same lactic acid fermentation process. It also occurs when muscle cells need energy or during hypoxia when there is not enough oxygen. For instance, during intense exercise or during sprinting, which is basically just running over a short distance, and during this time, the muscle cells may not receive oxygen fast enough to generate energy. And in that case, cells use anaerobic metabolism or anaerobic glycolysis to generate energy in the form of ATP. So when cells generate energy in the ab absence of oxygen, that is called anaerobic exercise or anaerobic metabolism. Now, Cori cycle involves the synthesis of glucose through gluconeogenesis. And the starting material for this reaction is lactate, which is synthesized in the skeletal muscles. So here in the skeletal muscle, glucose is converted to lactate and lactate is then transported to liver. And in the liver, it is then converted back to glucose and then this glucose is again uh, transported to muscle. So this is what we are going to learn about. This is basically the Cori cycle and why uh, this cycle occurs uh, between skeletal muscle and liver. So before we jump into the Cori cycle, I first want to quickly talk about an aerobic and aerob anaerobic metabolism. So we all know that glucose is broken down into two molecules of pyruvate through glycolysis and through the process two molecules of ATP are consumed whereas four molecules of ATP are synthesized and during the pathway NAD plus is reduced to NADH. Now from here phase of pyruvate is determined by the presence or absence of oxygen in the cells. Now in the absence of oxygen that is during aerobic condition pyruvate is oxidized to acetyl-CoA and then acetyl-CoA is oxidized through TCA cycle or Krebs cycle and from there through electron transport chain or oxidative phosphorylated phosphorylation molecules of ATP are synthesized. Now in the absence of ATP the fate of pyruvate is different in different organisms. So for instance in vertebrates pyruvate is converted to lactate with the help of enzyme lactate dehydrogenase whereas in yeast pyruvate is converted to ethanol and carbon dioxide. Now again let's take an example of exercising muscle. So in exercising muscle when there is not enough oxygen or during anaerobic condition glucose through glycolysis is converted into pyruvate and then pyruvate is converted into lactate. Now lactate is then transported to blood and from blood it is then transported to liver and in the liver lactate is again converted back to glucose sorry and in through circulation glucose is again transported back to skeletal muscle where it can again be used um, to synthesize energy through glycolysis. Now as I mentioned that anaerobic glycolysis takes place in exercising muscle it also occurs in red blood cells which lack mitochondria and this is important because uh, oxidation of pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, TCA cycle or Krebs cycle and electron transport chain or oxidative phosphorylation, all these three stages of cellular respiration take place in mitochondria. And because red blood cells lack mitochondria, it relies on generating energy in the form of ATP only through glycolysis or through anaerobic glycolysis. Now, it can also take place in poorly vascularized cornea. It also occurs during hypoxia, uh, for instance, during myocardial infarction, pulmonary embolism, hemorrhage, and during shock. Now, I quickly want to elaborate on aerobic glycolysis in exercising muscle. Now, during aerobic exercise, glucose can be obtained from glycogen. So, skeletal muscle has a capacity to store glucose in the form of glycogen. So when it requires, glucose can be obtained by breaking down glycogen through glycogenolysis. Or glucose can be also obtained through GLUT4 transporter from the circulations. Once glucose is obtained, it is then broken down through sequence of reaction through glycolysis to form glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. And this is the first half of glycolysis pathway where it consumes two molecules of ATP. 
and subsequently glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is then converted into 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate with the help of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase enzyme and in the reaction NAD plus is reduced to NADH and through the subsequent reaction it is then finally converted into two molecules of pyruvate and this is the second half of glycolysis pathway where it synthesizes four molecules of ATP. Now here I am saying two molecules of pyruvate because our starting material which is glucose is basically a six carbon molecule and pyruvate is three carbon molecule so therefore glucose is broken down into two molecules of pyruvate. So when there is enough oxygen or during aerobic exercise through oxidative decarboxylation pyruvate is then converted into acetyl-CoA and carbon dioxide and during the process it also reduces NAD plus to NADH and acetyl-CoA is then oxidized through TCA cycle or Krebs cycle and subsequently electrons from NADH and FADH2 are then transported to electron transport chain or through oxidative phosphorylation to synthesize ATP. So basically when there is enough oxygen muscle cells can generate uh, 36 or 38 molecules of ATP through glycolysis. Now let's talk about anaerobic exercise meaning how do muscle cells obtain energy when there is not enough oxygen. So during intense exercise oxygen may not reach the muscle cells fast enough to keep up with the workout. And because there is not enough oxygen, the three stages of cellular respiration that is pyruvate oxidation to acetyl-CoA, TCA cycle and electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation cannot take place. Why? Because the final electron acceptor that is oxygen is absent in the skeletal muscle and therefore pyruvate cannot be processed through these three different stages. Now when we talk about uh, absence of presence of oxygen it is only the last stage of cellular respiration th that is oxidative phosphorylation directly uses oxygen therefore without this oxidative phosphorylation the first two stages of cellular respiration that is pyruvate oxidation to acetyl coa and tca cycle cannot take place okay now let's talk about what happens to pyruvate so one of the very important reaction of glycolysis is the oxidation of glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate to 13 b phosphoglycerate and the reaction is carried out by glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogen enzyme and during the reaction it also reduces NAD plus to NADH and because of this the amount of NADH being generated is higher than amount of NAD plus is being regenerated and therefore the ratio of NADH to NAD plus is higher and when the ratio of NADH to NAD plus is higher this favors the this favors the reaction towards reduction of pyruvate to lactate and the reduction of pyruvate to lactate is catalyzed by the enzyme called lactate dehydrogenase that is LDH and during the reaction NAD plus is oxidized to NADH and also here lactate with two hydrogen ions so in combined it is called lactic acid so now the question is why does skeletal muscle reduce pyruvate to lactate what is the reason behind it and so first thing we know that muscles need energy and because there is no oxygen it relies completely on anaerobic glycolysis to generate energy so when pyruvate is reduced to lactate it oxidizes NADH to NAD plus and when this NAD plus is regenerated now it can then be used to oxidize glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate to 13 bis phosphoglycerate now if this NAD plus is not generated through this reaction the glycolysis pathway cannot function so the main reason for reduction of pyruvate to lactate is to regenerate this NAD plus and prevents glycolysis from cease to function. Now what happens to lactate once it is synthesized? The thing is lactate is just the byproduct. It doesn't have any other function. It cannot even be used to generate energy. However, if there is too much lactate being synthesized, it gets accumulated in the skeletal muscle and then it can cause lactic acidosis. So this lactate must be removed from the muscle to prevent this lactic acidosis. So the next thing I want to talk about is how this lactate is being removed from the skeletal muscle. So now once the lactate and these two hydrogen ions which are formed, they can be first transported into blood through a transporter called MCT1 which is basically the monocarboxylic acid transporter 1. So through this transporter lactate is transported uh, into blood 
and this transporter can also transport the hydrogen ions into the blood and remember that if there are too many hydrogen ions being transported inside the blood it can actually decrease the intracellular pH and causes blood to become acidotic and to prevent this blood has a really good buffering system which requires bicarbonate to form carbonic acid and this carbonic acid then disposes into water and carbon dioxide and this carbon dioxide is then exhaled out so this is how blood takes care of too much of hydrogen ion using the buffering system to prevent the blood from becoming acidotic now let's talk about what happens to lactate once inside the blood now liver also has the same mct1 transporter that is monocarboxylic acid transporter one so through this transporter, lactate is then transported into the liver. Now, unlike skeletal muscle, liver has enough oxygen in the hepatocytes. And because of that, the ratio of NADH to NAD plus is lower. That means hepatocytes has more NAD plus. And because of that, it pushes the reaction towards oxidation of lactate to pyruvate, again with the same enzyme, lactate dehydrogenase. And through this reaction, it also reduces NAD plus to NADH. Now once the pyruvate is formed, it is then converted into glucose through the process called gluconeogenesis. And gluconeogenesis actually consumes six molecules of ATP. And two enzymes which play a very important role in gluconeogenesis are glucose 6-phosphatase and fructose 1,6-bisphosphatase. Now once glucose is formed, it is then transported through the circulation into the skeletal muscle. And once inside the skeletal muscle, glucose is either stored in the form of glycogen or it can directly used uh, to synthesize energy through glycolysis. Now, one very important thing I want to mention about the glucose 6-phosphatase enzyme. So, skeletal muscles actually lack this glucose 6-phosphatase enzyme and that is actually the very reason that lactate cannot be recycled into glucose in the skeletal muscles and therefore lactate has to travel this long route to get inside the liver and inside the liver then it will recycle into glucose and then glucose will be then transported again into skeletal muscles to synthesize energy through glycolysis so this is basically the overview of Cori cycle so that Two important thing to remember about Cori cycle first is it provides this uh, or it regenerates this NAD plus to be used for glycolysis pathway in order for glycolysis to continue and secondly it actually recycles lactate back into glucose to be used or to be transported into skeletal muscles and uh, which can then be used um, to synthesize energy through glycolysis now I also want to talk about the energy cost of Cori cycle. So in the skeletal muscle we know that through glycolysis two molecules of ATP are consumed and four molecules of ATP are being synthesized. So when you sum up in total there are basically two molecules of ATP produced through glycolysis in the skeletal muscle. Now in the liver when lactate is being recycled into glucose through glycolysis gluconeogenesis it actually consumes six molecules of ATP so Cori cycle results in a net consumption of four molecules of ATP so basically it is actually a very expensive process but it is still worth it because it allows glycolysis pathway to continue to synthesize these two molecules of ATP even though the amount of ATP generated seems very small but it could be life-saving during intense exercise or even during the period when it is required to re-establish the adequate blood flow to the tissues. Now lastly I quickly want to talk about the importance of Cori cycle. First it is important because it prevents lactic acidosis in muscle by removing the lactate and hydrogen ion from the skeletal muscles. Secondly it transport, transports lactate to the liver and in the liver it then recycles into glucose through gluconeogenesis and as I mention it before remember that it has uh, the lactate must be transported to liver because one of the very important enzyme of gluconeogenesis that is glucose 6 phosphatate that enzyme is not present in skeletal muscle therefore lactate must be transported to liver in order to recycle into the glucose secondly it also maintains glucose level and energy by recycling the lactate into the glucose 
and it also allows the functioning of extra hepatic cells such as red blood cells which lack mitochondria and they totally rely on glycolysis to synthesize energy and there are also some limitations of cori cycle first it is not meant to be used for long term because it is not as efficient as the body's usual energy process like Krebs cycle or oxidative phosphorylation which synthesizes 36 or 38 molecules of ATP and it costs more energy because Cori cycles in total it consumes six molecules of ATP and therefore Cori cycles recycling of glucose cannot be sustained indefinitely. So I really hope that you understand Cori cycle and if you do so please like and share the video and subscribe the channel and I will see you soon next time. Thank you so much for watching.